This is exactly right. What'd you say? My favorite murder. Oh, this is my <laughs> favorite murder. The podcast. Thanks, everybody. Hey, we decided to start with song every episode. Do you like light jazz? <laughs> so do we. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, it's getting more uncomfortable at the top of the mm. show. The yeah. more, the longer we do it. Every time I, I, I hear our uh, intros as we're doing them, I think of the person in a car with her friend who's like, you have to listen to this podcast. Just please listen to it, mom. You're going to love it. Right. And then the opening <laughs> comes in and it's like, okay. It gets better. It gets better. They do this they, all they the time. Always, they are always. It's like funny because it's always so uncomfortable. It's funny because it's so bad you don't want to listen to it, and that's what they call irony, mom. Mom, stop judging me. Mom, stop gripping the steering wheel like that. Can I tell you a mom story, please? I, <laughs> in the ongoing saga of my relationship with my lifetime relationship with my mother, it's always for life with those women. For <laughs> just they're just there all every holiday oh my god until they're not and <laughs> that's so depressing mm-hmm. my mom's mom lived to be 104 so i've got a fucking wild girl. girl yeah that's really heartening so i told her uh i sent out an email to my family being like hey we're playing the orpheum on you know in march in la and we're you guys i want you to come it's like a big fucking deal you know it's yep. like la hometown show big the deal. orpheum's a gorgeous just theater i'm like excited it's so good and my dad wrote back i'll be there you know with plus five and <laughs> it was you know this person of course we're gonna go and then my mom wrote back literally this is all she wrote what time <laughs> no i'm t- i'm saying what time because it was a question mark what time that what was time a, period was, yeah <laughs> what time i'm saying it as it was written that and you know that was her inflection you know that was her and i know that's how 71 year olds write emails yes you know what i mean like they don't it's just get any letter out that you can yeah. and hit send <laughs> this is coming from a woman too who went to fucking dc for like a trip and called and left a voicemail and said um i won't have long distance so call john if you need anything <laughs> How was she getting a hold of you? Long distance isn't a thing <laughs> anymore. Did she mean cellular service? I don't think. She, no, I don't think she knows that everyone has long distance. Like that. That's the thing. It's this isn't fucking ten ten three two one anymore. <laughs> Mom, I'm calling you on a calling card, so I have to make this yeah. quick. I don't, only have seven call minutes me. left. Oh, Jan. Janet. Janet, come on. Standing ovation at the Orpheum. If she goes, <laughs> if it's not past her fucking bedtime. What time? What time? What she, I think really what she was saying is, please, Georgia, when you communicate with the family, get really specific. I think so, too. Just let's get organized in these emails. So it's my fault. Yeah. That you're playing the Orpheum. <laughs> hey, guys, we're playing the Orpheum on March 16th. Hopefully you can come. It's not sold out, is it? I don't know. They released some tickets, so it might not be completely. I don't know. Hey, look, I mean, if you're interested, look into it. I don't know. You don't have to. I mean, do your thing. We feel like you've given us enough already. (laughs) (laughs) We don't want to make you do anything. My family on the other hand needs to fucking be there. They need to step up. What have they done for me? Now, do you know that my father actually, my sister (gasps) called me on this along the same line and my father called her and said, uh, when he heard we were playing the Orpheum said let's go down and be there for that show so my sister's like oh my god dad wants to come down it's a big deal because his hips all screwed up so he walks like an orangutan I get it uh, you've seen it so then <laughs> my sister's like so I think we're gonna come down and she my sister's getting all excited or whatever and then I said that all sounds great you know we'll we'll make it all work for dad and I said but you do know that we're coming up back up to San Francisco in the fall and the second I sent the message of there's a possibility mm-hmm. this is this won't be the last show that you possibly could come to. Yeah. My dad goes, oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Just immediately, immediately bails on the plan. I want him to come because it'll be like our families are there. I know. And then my, Marty and your dad could hang out. Oh, my God. My dad will just shout over Marty's head. Can we talk about our double date with your dad? Please. <laughs> 
one of the most romantic evenings <laughs> that I've experienced in a while. <laughs> Fucking, he was down here and Karen sheepishly one of those you don't have to do it it's totally fine if you don't want to and like I know it's weird and it's big do you guys want to go to dinner and Vince and I of course like yes it felt like we had just gotten off yeah. like a nine day tour together where yeah. I was like hey how about you make more plans like with no me? you guys don't want to see me and I also another kill Gareth but please come please come oh my god it was the best we went to fucking fancy pants Moose and Franks which was like the fanciest thing. It's My like dad always is a special occasion. He's obsessed with Moose and Franks. I love it. He, we went there. He also has great memories because we went there. Uh, I think it might have been 15 years ago. And, uh, I was with some of my friends. Um, one of whom was my friend, Kevin Sesha, who decided he was going to drink whiskey neat as his oh. drink. So everyone else was ordering beer and wine or whatever. And he orders, no. he basically orders a double shot of whiskey. And my dad goes, Jesus, do you have a gunfight in the morning? <laughs> and then that was like legend for a while. Oh my God. And when my dad said, make the reservation I want to go to he kept joking about it where I'm like dad if you actually want to go to Moose and Franks we can he's like well I, I, mean, I would like to go there and then he goes remember we went there and your friend was drinking all that whiskey <laughs> I was like yeah I did. for someone who drinks that as much as my dad does it really stood out to him that my friends were doing whiskey I shots love it. little did he know that that's all I drank constantly it was the best <laughs> it was so good and then like meeting someone's dad and like this is why you're this way. You know what I mean? Like, not even like, he didn't do anything or say, he said some funny shit, but like, just to be like, oh, this is what you were raised by. Okay, this is good to know. Yes. And and then I could see you getting embarrassed when he said certain things, he did certain things that I didn't give a shit about. You well, know? there was points where he was talking directly over Georgia. Yeah. Like, Georgia would go, da da da, and he would just, well, and then I finally realized, and I was mortified, and I realized, oh, he can't hear her, because it was really loud in the restaurant. My dad has, he is such bad fireman hearing that if you have no, to have a over 70 year old hearing yeah it's over but but also all the bells that's oh, why geez. he was started telling you guys that story of yeah. all the bells going in all the houses every time there was a fire oh, that that's guy. how the that's how the bell system was set up in the firehouses in san francisco oh, so no. he the bells just were going off all day long Poor in wives. their ears oh i see what you're saying so they basically they all have hearing damage from like 60s <sighs> to the 80s or whenever they put in their new system but like i get it you said it to me. You were like so embarrassed about it, and I don't care, and did, and totally understood what was going on. Well, it just I didn't want you to think he was a blowhard because he's really not. <laughs> he's, but he just kept starting conversations because he didn't look at Georgia like he would start it and look up and Georgia yeah. would be like, oh, like no, you were trying to ask it. him a question. I loved it. I just can't sit in silence. Uh, <laughs> there yeah, wasn't much. There wasn't. It was actually it was really really fun. Yeah, Vince and I adored him. Okay, good adored him no he's really is like a, an american classic and just a good time yeah i uh, there, there are a few people that don't have fun with jim kilgariff no jim is our favorite unless you wear a keep america uh make america great again hat and then he'll tell you to take well, it fucking then, off your dad and my dad are not <laughs> going to get along uh, we'll just make a no hats rule okay and so, everybody will be fine okay great um do you have any yo yeah it's the corrections corner that uh -huh. has needed to happen since the moment the last episode dropped. You've practiced it twice it's, so far because it's, it's so unfair. You practiced it twice at the Salt Lake City shows over the weekend, which were <laughs> fucking <laughs> awesome and fun. And thank yes. you, Salt Lake City. Thank you, Salt Lake City. So much fun. What an amazing weekend. Yeah. We had already just had uh, so much fun in Cleveland and Columbus. Like we were just ha yeah. every show is so fun. And, and it was it, like our last shows on tour. Yeah. Until Europe. And yeah. it was just it was great. It was so fun. It was so gorgeous in that city. Yeah. Um, so but the interesting thing was uh, the we actually did a show Thursday night, which we almost never do. So the episode had dropped oh, that yeah. day. So we were real time with the podcast. So weird. So I got to do a basically a real time hours later corrections corner, explaining that yes, in fact, the reason that Georgia had didn't hear about the tree trimmer murder, the Matthew Hoffman guy that had all the leaves in his living room and that creepy story. That had happened in November. And that, I was like, how did I not hear about this? And I was like, you know why you haven't heard about it? Because it's so fresh off the presses. Well, actually, <laughs> and in truth, it had happened uh, in 2010, mm -hmm. in November of 2010. <laughs> so I was eight years off. And that's why you hadn't heard of it. And I 
I actually went and looked at the, thank God I still had the um, article on my like reading tab mm-hmm. and I opened it up like, I bet you this is one of those articles that has a current date, but then they're re-quoting. I, there's right. some lie I made up to myself. Yeah. Nope. Right there. It was, it was, the article was from 2011 reporting back so a couple months before. how did that happen? Before. You think one time you put in 2017 on accident and it came? No, it's purely, I wanted it to be, okay. I wanted it to, to have just happened. You were so excited, like this fresh murder, like we always do old shit. It's going to be like exciting. Yes. And I feel like with the way um, the murderino community is, with the way people tell us stuff, the yeah. way Twitter is, if there was... Like, it just felt like to me, like I had stumbled upon a thing that I found first, Mm -hmm. which is insanity when you think about like how quickly those stories go up on the Facebook page or how quickly people share things. One person will like, will like tweet us about it and then you just won't hear about it again. Right. So I could see that. I just think I got so obsessed with those leaves that everything else (laughs) kind of went faded out around it. It was pretty fucking great. I mean, that was, it was great. Either way, it was great. It, it it was a fun experience. Um, I'm sorry, you have to. You had to. I'm done apologizing for it. This yeah. is the third time, third and final. <laughs> I fucking did it and live we'll to everybody. Talk about it again. We're taking that episode down. <laughs> We're gonna take it down. It's the lost episode. Stephen d- Stephen accidentally deleted it. Oh That's no, right. Steven. Yeah. So I hope everyone's happy. Uh, <laughs> but now you know I'll be better at checking dates and um, everybody. It was really funny. The people who did post on Twitter were trying to be so tactful and light about it yeah it where it was like um so i don't want to be this person but you're a fucking are... decade off friend it was just like <laughs> oh man well it happens can't get it right i wanted to uh shout to shout out oh god what am i a fucking vj yes you are i am didn't you know i didn't know mm-hmm. you're jj uh, jackson one of the gifts we got of course we had a ton of stuff in utah because everyone's mormon and they just like craft like <laughs> not everyone wizards. Is they're all mormon <laughs> um they're wizards and mm-hmm. so one of the things we got was like a beautiful there was two earrings and two necklaces that i found out it's called quilled where you take a piece of paper and you turn it into like a flower or whatever the fuck yep quilled so this girl named mandy lee took pages from my sweet Audrina <laughs> and made us th- gorgeous jewelry out of it. Gorgeous. And so she, you can buy it at um, Artsy Heartsy Boutique on Etsy and see it. And so I was looking her up. She also did that that adorable line drawing or like stick figure drawing of small foreign faction of us in a band and you and I are playing. Yeah. That woman with Elvis on the drums. Yes. She made that too. Okay. So she sells mugs and t-shirts and shit of that art print as well as my sweet Audrina quilled jewelry. <laughs> and like she does the quilled jewelry is like her thing and she does a ton of um Harry Potter book pages. Oh nice. With it. So <gasps> oh, I know I, just, I know a bunch of people who are gonna like yeah, that. It's like really pretty fucking jewelry. And then it also is from my sweet Audrina, which is there the were best. little strips of paper on the back, like it would yeah. be the thing that the earrings were like pressed into or mm-hmm. whatever. And then there would just be a strip of like my sister Vera said yeah. it was like these lines from that. So book. you knew what it was from. <laughs> I love it. So and good. I mean we get so many we're sitting amongst a pile like post Steven stopping by the P.O. box picking up boxes like fucking cool as shit gifts yeah someone someone drunkenly accidentally <gasps> went on it, ebay and drunkenly bought six packs of true crime trading cards yes only to find that in their state bought six boxes of packs of trading cards <laughs> yes. so sent us each a box of we get a them. whole box i don't know how many are in here but it's amazing a ton right a ton yeah i'm just it's just we're so lucky it's like this is the box they would sell at the store yeah it's so cool it's oh really cool also some this is another additional corrections corner that somebody pointed out that we weren't just talking yeah. about the terminator and robo cop but oh. but you had also folded in a little bit of total recall into that story as well <laughs> i wasn't even gonna correct that because i feel like that's not none of that's a mistake it's just <laughs> fucking fate and it's how this oh what did you say to the podcast you said someone tweeted you and was like i hate to tell you guys but you're uh you you were talking about two different movies and you said like you tweeted back are you new oh, oh no 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 it was like it was basically a guy who and i'm sure he was a fan or whatever but yeah. he was yeah he was just going 
they were talking about this, but then they actually turned it into this and then this. Uh, and they never stopped. It was like this basically oh, a statement ever were that like, we never acknowledged it or even yeah. knew it was happening. And I just wrote back, you must be new here. Because it's just like, <laughs> when doesn't that fucking happen? That's why I was in corrections court of that thing. It's because like, we just fucking kept going. And I believed you and you believed in me. I could there, see it all in my there head. There might have been a little bit of men in black in there too, for all we know. Here's the thing. We can't wait to hear your podcast and how great that's going to fucking <laughs> and go. And how zero mistakes are ever <sighs> fucking made. When it's Let us talk. On the cuff. Let us fucking talk. And one of you has whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just also wanted to say, okay. I just want to give a public formal apology to my dog, George, who... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> George went viral. Did you see this, Stephen? Oh, George... Fiercely George, private. My fiercely private dog, George, who doesn't want to be a part of this podcast in any way. <laughs> um, I did a little video of her because she always drinks my fucking water. She didn't just drink. You made a video where she basically, if the, if dogs could double flip you off. Yes. She fucking did a walk by drink out of your <laughs> mug. And then Karen dryly going, that's mine. That's mine. Uh, that's the best. She... And it's only a four second video. Yeah. I highly recommend if you want to express yourself in any way, do it under five seconds. Yeah. People really appreciate it. Totally. But she looks right at me. And then when I say that's mine, she wags her tail and walks away. Yeah. Cause like she knows really she's not supposed sweet. to be doing it. It's very cute. But then all she's these people. She's also gorgeous. So it's like. She's a lovely lady. I like that dog because she looks different. Like when she's drinking the water, her ears are all long and flat and she looks like a hound. Uh -huh. But if she hears like a squirrel in the backyard, then her ears flap Aww. up and she looks like a lab. Like she just changes constantly. Um, She's like Ted Bundy. <laughs> Wait, sometimes she wears a really big turtleneck, and then sometimes she wears a mock turtleneck. Teeth are real fucked up. <laughs> That's what got her. Uh, but she ended up becoming a Twitter moment, and then so all these people that a all these moment. That listeners like are like, day. "Ha ha ha!" George is famous. You George. got so mad. I saw your response. To, what? This is fucked up. I know. I was well. The first whoever sent it to me first. I thought they were making a joke. Yeah. And so then when I looked at it, I was like, what the hell? Like, what is happening? Because I don't understand how. I don't either. The whole moment's page, I don't understand. Yeah, it's like, understand. is it just for you? Well, yeah. and meanwhile, I'm sitting here with Elvis petting him, and all he's been doing his whole life is trying to get fucking famous on, <laughs> Go viral. on the internet. And he's like, this fucking bitch? George? This fucking bitch comes in off the side? Uh-uh. She's very mad, and she's not talking to me. Yeah. Elvis will ride her down a set of stairs. <laughs> you know, he did that once with a dog. Really? I found a stray. I brought it into my backyard. I lived like up a staircase and I went in to get some food for this stray. It was like, like George, like a dog that size. And then I came out to like squeeze through the door to bring this dog the food and Elvis broke through the door and the dog was at the top of the stairs waiting for the food. Elvis jumped on the dog's back, rode it down the stairs and chased it, <laughs> rode a dog and just chased it out of the yard. Wow. And the dog didn't come back. Aww. And he's like, I'll take that food, please. That's <laughs> mine has. now. Oh, what a good boy. Okay. With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step -step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie-smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and, and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Goodbye. Who's first? Uh, you. Is it me? uh yeah, it's you. Yes. <laughs> Drinking. I love going first. Drink <laughs> if you're first. Drink if you're first. 
drink if you're wearing a house dress. Absolutely. You know what? I left my favorite house dress in uh, Cleveland. You did? How? I just left it on. There was a bath and I left it near the bath. Oh, that sucks. I'm so sad. So this is my replacement. Is it the magenta one? The one I loved so much. Like a vintage Komodo. Yeah, that was a good one. Very culturally, what's it called? Appropriating, but. Well, you know what it is? You shouldn't have worn the kabuki makeup. (laughs) That was what bothered me the most about it. <clears throat> As it should. <laughs> um, okay, so this is this is something I found or rediscovered, I should say, from one of the articles of like I just found like the ten weirdest unsolved mysteries segments. Okay, are you going into are you doing the thing where now you're Googling like bizarre uh-huh. murder? Yes, okay. There's a lot of good there's not a lot of good YouTube videos, but there's a lot of YouTube videos of those like the top five, whatever. Yes. And for some reason people use voiceover, like um computer voice. Computer voices. Yes. But you can find a lot of interesting stuff there. Um and so this is one of them. Um, that I had forgotten about, but I know I saw when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's creepy as fuck. Here we go. Okay. On June 8th, 1989, sidebar, my ninth birthday. Oh. Whatever. In the Vancouver, British Columbia suburb of Richmond, the body of 44-year-old nurse Cindy James was found in the yard of a aband- abandoned house. Oh, I forgot to say that this is about the death of Cindy James. Okay. Okay. Cindy had been drugged and strangled, and her hands and feet had been tied behind her back. Her feet had been tied behind her back? That's well, if she's hogtied. Yeah. Ugh. She wasn't. Oh. But the police weren't sure if Cindy's death was an accident, or if a murder, or if she had committed suicide. What? By tying her hands. Okay. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cindy Jones, who, if she were to be played in a, you know, recreation of fucking Unsolved of Mysteries, this story, yep. or would be played by Vanna White. Oh. 1980s Vanna White. So just like ideal, everybody's 80s ideal blonde? Beautiful blonde, vivacious, bright woman. She's a 19-year-old nursing student when she meets... Uh, at her, the hospital at Vancouver General Hospital, she meets Dr. Roy Makepeace. Mm. Sounds fake, right? Mm-hmm. He's a psychiatrist and he's 18 years older than her and married with two kids, but they fall in love. Oh. So 19 year old, uh, Cindy falls in love with him. And sorry, he's 28. How? He's 18 years older than her. Oh, 18 years. So it's 18 plus 19. I'm 41. I'm truly the last person you should have asked that question. <laughs> Is that right, Stephen? No. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> oh, 41. Nobody here knows numbers. It's, it's 37. 19, it's 37. 37. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go to college, kids. Oh, sorry. Can I quickly sidebar? Always. There's somebody that tweeted and was like, Karen, keep. Anytime Karen wants to name something boring, she calls them an accountant. <laughs> and it's like, it's like the third accountant we've heard from that's like, we're really not as boring as you say we are. And I feel really bad. I apologize to that person who tweeted. And what I just is it gonna, say. What's going to be the next one then? It has to be something else. I'll think about it and it'll be something maybe jokey or more lighthearted and the one that'll hurt people's feelings less. But, but I they'll did, still be mad at you, whoever those people are. Mm-hmm. Well, Communications majors. There's how about somebody, Amish? The Amish. That's boring. Okay. But they can't get, contact me. What about candle makers? You're Good. Right. Yes. That's a hobby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking it's tidal wave of candle maker emails. I make I a make good a living. Good. Fuck you. I have insurance. Oh my god. I have insurance. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Okay. Here we are. Yes. She fall. They fall in love with each other. Uh, within four days of Roy's divorce, he and Cindy are married. Four days. Uh huh. So nineteen year old Cindy and twenty thirty seven year old. Roy, Roy are married, okay. which is like okay. So I'm 37. If I were boning a fucking 19 year old, you'd be like, "What are you doing?" Right? Yeah, that is uh too young, too young, and also, but it's also the 80s. You know, you're he's sh- having a midlife crisis. Obviously, yeah. his wife and two kids are like, "I'm sorry, what?" Yeah, okay. Uh, he's a doctor, you say? He's a psychiatrist. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so they get married. Cindy graduates from nursing school. Later, she becomes an administrator uh, at a program for children with behavioral and emotional issues. She's like the best. So after 16 years of marriage, they didn't have kids. Cindy ends things with uh, Dr. Makepeace. This seems to be amicable. Uh, that's in 1982. They split up. And that's when 
her life hits the fan. So four months into their trial separation, Cindy starts to receive anonymous phone calls from a man who knows her name, knows where she lives, is like threatening her uh, sometimes or just breathing into the phone sometimes. Um, and it was really scaring the shit out of her. It's very scary. Yeah. After uh, a week after the call starts, someone smashes her window uh, and breaks in while she, or breaks and smashes her window while she's out. And later that same week, an intruder, uh, somehow has a key to her house, gets into the house and stabs her pillow over a dozen times. Fuck. Which is like, shit, man. I just realized, I think I saw the headline for this story and the like Getty image for the story because there was a knife on a pillow and it when? said, this was, I like recently and it was like this is the most fucked up X story you'll ever hear X story EX I don't know what's X mean like her ex-husband <laughs> I was like is that MK Ultra? And I don't know about <laughs> I was X stands for a word I don't want to say I get it <laughs> I, I, I'm wrong I'm wrong, uh-huh. I'm wrong yes no you're you might be right okay but you're not okay but uh, it could be got it is it we don't know we certainly don't know and we're not going to say right now is it it's it might be an unsolved mystery a go- oh we don't know <laughs> shit context <laughs> clues you said it four times yeah but that show was on has been on like this came this is from like the fucking 80s so like oh, right. you know or 90s from the 90s okay blah, 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 blah. 16 years of marriage they break up shit hits the fan <laughs> uh threatening uh stabs her pillow okay Bizarre notes written in kidnapping font, a.k.a. my favorite murder That's right. <laughs> logo font, <laughs> yes. begin to appear on her doorstep and on her windshield of her car. One card uh, has a picture of a woman who looks like Cindy, a.k.a. Vanna White. The woman's eyes have been scratched out, and another time the woman's throat, like there's red ink around her throat. Uh, the police investigate but couldn't track anyone, and the phone calls she were getting were too short to be traced, so they can't figure out who's doing this. Maybe somebody who knows how tracing calls works, though. Great. Ding dong. Great okay. idea. Thank you. Other things happen, like her porch lights are smashed, her phone lines get cut, all these things keep fucking happening. She freaks out, she decides to move, and on January 27th, 1982, the first physical attack occurs. Fuck. Cindy's good friend and neighbor, Agnes Woodcock. Leave it alone. Pause for dramatic effect. (laughs) Pause for conversation throughout the office. Uh Had agreed to spend the night so Cindy would feel safer. So Agnes gets to... Sorry, how old is Agnes? I I mean... 72? You'd hope. That's a non-solution. Is this going to become another Bonnie? Where are we at? That's a non-solution. Inviting an Agnes over? Yes. Come on. (laughs) Get you... It what is. Is Agnes a fucking Navy SEAL? Then get her out of there. You don't need company yeah. if you if you feel threatened. Get someone that's threatening. I mean, maybe Agnes is a fucking bodybuilder. Perhaps. Let's not <laughs> you cast, tell. I'll let you tell Let's me. not cast aspersions. Okay. This ends with Agnes being a bodybuilder. No. No, it doesn't. <laughs> that's the big reveal. That big reveal. Okay. Agnes gets there around 930 at night. Cindy's not answering the door, so she goes around to go to the back. Oh, no. And she hears moaning. And Agnes finds Cindy on the ground with a black nylon stocking tied around her neck and sc- sc- some scratches on her body. And there's, they also find later a needle mark uh, on her arm. So Cindy tells authorities that she had been taking a load of boxes out to the garage, you know, because she's moving and shit. Yep. And finds that the light was out. But in the dark, someone grabs her from behind. She felt a pinprick on her arm. And she thinks she must have been drugged because that's all she remembers from the incident. Uh, and the the police are like, this is crazy. We're going to look into it. They look into her ex-husband, ex. Right. Like, stands for your ex. <laughs> remember? Right. Uh, he's got an alibi for the time of the attack, and investigators aren't able to find any signs of any attacker at all. Uh, and there are never any calls when the police are doing 24-hour surveillance. There's never any attacks when that's happening. They always happen when the police aren't around. And again, the calls are untraceable. So the police are starting to doubt Cindy's stories. Her parents thought the attacker clearly is smart enough to fucking not come the fuck around when there is surveillance. Yeah. Her friends and family try to convince her to move into actually like an apartment building where there's more people around, um, maybe to get a vicious dog or something. But she's like, I'm not fucking letting this take over my life. No. 
And they also worried because she would take, she had a small dog that she loved and she would take the dog out for walks at like 3 a.m. Mm. and wouldn't stop doing that. And they were like, were freaking out about it. But it, they thought it was weird that she wouldn't stop doing that. Yeah, you have to adjust a little bit if you are being threatened in some way. Right. That whole thing of I'm going to live my life exactly the way that's not. Yeah, unfortunately. But she does move into a new house. She paints her car and she changes her last name. And that's how she becomes Cindy James. So she also hires a private investigator named Ozzy Caban. Caban. Ozzy Caban. Mm-hmm. Which is like the best private investigator name it's ever. It's pretty. Re- O-Z-Z-Y like I-E. Osborne. I-E. Mm-hmm. Like Davis. Okay. He, uh, he says that she would be evasive at times and was withholding information from him and police. Um, but he did believe everything she was saying. She, he did think that she had a stalker and an attacker. Um, her mother thought that uh, because she, she was being evasive because she was threatened and feared for her family's life. Mm-hmm. And that's why that was happening. Her private investigator installed security lights around her house and gave her a two-way radio and a panic button just in case. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So one night, Ozzy hears strange sounds coming from the radio and rushes to Cindy's house. He finds Cindy lying unconscious in the hallway. He's like, break down the door. She has a paring knife through her hand and also like a note in it. So like they (gasps) paring knifed through her note in a hand. Uh you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like stuck through uh-huh. to the ground. I don't know how deep. I don't know what. Or like wherever she was, though. Yeah, she was like lying, lying unconscious. Ugh. And then they put a note and Fuck. a paring knife in her hand. The note said, you are dead, bitch. Fuck. Uh, all she remembered from that attack was that a needle was put into her arm. Uh, and also, she seemed to remember that it was more than one person. Like there might have been two or three assailants. Oh. At the time. Like. A couple of the attacks No fingerprints are found There's no clues There's no leads Uh, Aside from Cindy's injuries There's no evidence uh, Anyone else had been in the house So investigators Are frustrated with Cindy And they are like This chick is fucking doing this on her own They think she's staging all of this (sighs) So Hoping to convince investigators To take her more seriously Cindy's like Give me a fucking polygraph Uh she fails the polygraph twice. Oh, no. The operator suggests the stress she was under might have affected the results. And she's too embarrassed. She's embarrassed. So she wants the investigation to be shut down. She refuses to sign her statement. Um, and she says it's because she's afraid for her family. Then, December 11th, 1985, a cyclist finds Cindy lying in a ditch six miles from her home. She's dazed and semi-conscious. She's suffering from hypothermia, has cut some bruises all over her body, and she, again, had a black nylon stocking around her neck. Fuck. Um, All she's wearing is a man's work boot and glove. She doesn't remember anything that could help with the investigation. Man. And then one night, she has her friends, Agnes, our friend Agnes, Mm -hmm. and her husband spend the night to keep her safe. Her husband's there. All right. But he's tiny. <laughs> but he's a he's little... So, he's pocket-sized. Little baby. <laughs> they, are, the, they are all woken up in the middle of the night because the basement of the house is on fucking fire. No! Yeah. The phone line had been cut, so Agnes' husband fucking... Mr. Agnes fucking runs out <laughs> and sees a man standing at the curb and yells to him to call the fire department, but the man just runs off. Which is like, but everyone says like the man just ran off and everything you listen to. And then it's like, maybe he ran to fucking call 911. Oh, that's true. You know what I mean? Yeah, he doesn't. It's not cell phone time. Yeah, Yeah. I'm doing what you told me to do. Yeah, I'm going to run off. Maybe he ran off and called 911. Maybe. We don't know. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he started the fire. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he was scared of yelling (laughs) and he just ran. Maybe he was walking his dog in the middle of the night. We don't know. Police determined that the fire was started from inside the house. Because they saw no fingerprints on the window. They think the perp, the perp uh, would have used that window to get in. There's no fingerprints. It's fucking Jean Benet all over again. They determined that Cindy must have staged the incident. And there was also another fire that happened another time that they think she staged. Letters and phone calls continue. Uh, Cindy's like fucking no one will believe me that I'm being stalked and threatened and attacked she's freaking out about it in june 1985 she tell she's like going crazy she tells her physician that she wants to die 
So she's diagnosed with severe depression and committed to uh, the psych ward at a hospital in North Vancouver. Wow. Yeah. So while she's there, she's examined by a psychiatrist who says that Cindy's, he determines Cindy's troubles are, quote, self-initiated. He said she'd fallen into a, quote, a psychogenic fugue, an altered consciousness stemming from a deep-seated trauma, and that she wasn't even aware that she was behind everything. Mm-hmm. So she's there for 10 weeks and then is released. Okay. What do you think so far? I don't like that. Okay. <clears throat> it frustrates me. Here's the thing, and this is this is uh, clearly uh, just off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. you don't cut your own phone line. You don't stab your own hand. Yeah. Like people, there are people who do things like this all the time and they do it in a way like, I, the idea that you would be going past the point of normal, like, I'm trying to swindle people, but like, I think personally, psychopaths or people that try to manipulate a bunch of people at once by like, oh, my life is in terror, will not harm themselves to do that. Or will like, not, you know what I mean? Okay, but devil's advocate, they, they harm their children, Munchausen. Right. Yeah, but that's not them. That's an extension of them. Yeah, I mean, there is them. Munchausen. Too. Their hand does not get stabbed. Yeah. Well, and also Munchausen's would be, that would be an additional kind of issue. But this is that thing of like, if they're trying to say, like, cause what would the point of that be? Getting the attention of the police? Like she wants police attention? I don't know. Or emergency attention or something? What would the point of strangling yourself with a, a nylon be and wake up in the ditch with hypothermia? Like what? Is she getting what yeah. would the benefit be yeah is my that's a good question i'm couldn't be furring my brow further in total confusion <laughs> and what the fuck okay let's keep going because okay. it gets fucking weirder oh um boop boop bop no one did that okay hold on okay she gets out after 10 weeks then on october 22nd 26 1988 she's attacked for the fifth time fuck an rcmp officer Mounted police. Royal Canadian. Mounted, Mounted police. police. Officer. <laughs> discovered her unconscious in her car, nude from the waist down. Her hands are tied behind her back, and she's squeezing the panic button of her silent alarm. There's duct tape over her mouth. There's bruising and swelling over one of her eyes, and she has a uh, ni- black nylon stocking tied around her neck again. She's dressed to the hospital, and but no one else's fingerprints are at the scene there's they bring in a fucking police dog there's no scent to pick up at all there's no indication that anyone else was present okay she finally tells police that her tormentor is her ex-husband roy Makepeace. they encourage her they want her to phone him and confront him and tape the conversation uh, he Roy denies any involvement during the conversation and in fact he had he gave the police a recording from his own answering machine that contained a death threat. You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay. Yes. What? Do you want to? Yes. Okay. Mm. What? No, I do. Okay. No. <laughs> Whose podcast is that? Oh, shout out to the trail went cold with Roth and Warder. <laughs> Sorry, I saw that. Uh, what the fuck? And so everyone, I mean, Reddit loves this fucking story. Like, it sounds I've like a woman. I've definitely read about it before. Yeah. It does sound like a woman. It does. So Roy thinks that Cindy has multiple personalities and isn't even aware that she's doing these things to himself. And But he's like, I, but I'm not behind this. Okay. And they tend to believe him. Mm-hmm. The psychiatrist. Yeah. Hold on. Incoming. Here's Roy. And then a train comes by. Okay. So she had been given those two lie detector tests and had been showing deceit in them, but she's given a third one. uh, And when she's asked if she staged one of the attacks, uh, she says no, and she's judged to be truthful. So there's like a little bit of both going on. So after... Almost seven years after the harassment started, Cindy is now 44, goes missing on May 25th. Shit. Her car is discovered in the parking lot of a small shopping mall 
where she had gone that day to deposit her check and to do some grocery shopping. In fact, her groceries are found in the car. There's blood on the driver's side door of the car and items from her wallet are found under the car. Uh, So this is after nearly 100 well-documented cases of harassment, including threatening phone calls and notes, vandalism and arson. Three dead cats were found in her yard. Oh, I know. Sorry, Stephen. Uh. And me. Uh, (laughs) And five violent physical attacks between 1982 and 1989. Cindy's body is found dead. Ugh. Two weeks after her car had been found, Cindy was found, her body was found by a construction worker in the yard in an abandoned house a mile and a half from where her car had been parked. There's a fucking photo of it online. It's, it's not gruesome, but she said. Just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. A black nylon stocking was tied tightly around her neck, and the autopsy showed that Cindy died from an overdose of morphine and other drugs. Uh, th- there was a needle mark in her arm, but they had been taken orally. Oh. Yeah. Uh, So the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they believe that her death was an accident or suicide. They think she was responsible for her own death. Okay. So there's a fucking crazy coroner's inquest because they're like, did she, was she killed by her stalker finally after six and a half years or did she do this for herself? It becomes the lengthiest and most expensive public inquest in British Columbia's history. Wow. 84 witnesses are called to testify. There's a knot specialist who comes and is like, so her arms were tied behind her back. And the knot specialist shows how she could have tied up her legs, then tied up her arms in front of her and stepped through to tie them up behind her back. Oh, yeah. Within three minutes, he could have shown, he could have, she could have done that. Um, also that, uh, da, 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 da. so she had an overdose of morphine, but so people are like, how could she have done those things after taking morphine? But she had taken them orally, which meant she would have had like 15 to 60 minutes before that kicked in to tie herself up and, do, and to walk to that spot a mile and a half from her car. Mm-hmm. So it was still possible she could have done it and maybe put the needle mark in her arm as a uh, like red just, herring. Yes, mm-hmm. that's the word. Thank you. But also they didn't find a needle or a vial or anything near her body or near her car. Um, and sorry, the idea is she ties herself up and then takes a mile and a half walk. She takes a mile and a half walk or whatever, gets to this place somehow. And then does the tying. Then does the tying, maybe takes the morphine then, and then dies. Okay. Um, so, da, 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 da. but also the weird, but the weird thing too is that her body, the, the place where her body is found in the abandoned uh, yard is really close to the street. You can see in an old video, like an old interview with her, with Ozzy, her fucking police dude. Mm-hmm. It's close to the street, almost like someone should have smelled it or or saw her and nobody did. So that was weird. And Ozzy, was, who still believed her, was like, that must mean that she had been dumped later, close to the time when she was found. Yeah, because somebody would have watched her walk in or like seen her around or smelled a body or seen her body lying. Oh, because it was there. Yeah, got it. Got it. So maybe. Um, So and now, well, okay. After three months of this coroner's inquest, the jury couldn't decide and called her death due to a quote unknown event. Whoa! And the death is classified classified as undetermined and still is. So, of course, there's a shit ton of theories on the case and on Reddit, especially no one agrees. Uh, I'm like, did she, okay, did she have a mental illness? Dis- uh, dissociative identity disorder is one of the things. Munchausen, schizophrenia. Uh, some people are like, maybe it started with an actual stalker and no one believed her. And so she kind of escalated it to make people believe her and accidentally did these things to herself and then they look into like every single time she was found bound it was near a place where she would have been found quickly or she had the panic button in her hand right so she would have never been left like long enough she knew that agnes was coming at 9 30 at night she knew that she had the walkie-talkie with ozzy and so he heard weird sounds and came over she put her own body you know she expected to be found that last time when she died because Mm -hmm. she was near a walkway Oh, it's just that no one actually found No one her. actually found You know what I mean? It's like, this is one of those cases where there's so many reasons behind both of the answers. Either she did it herself or she, there was an actual murderer and stalker. 
And there's and and you know even when I was writing this and everyone has their own fucking opinion even when I was writing this I found myself leaving shit out because I thought she did it to herself mm-hmm. so I found myself leaving stuff out that didn't support it and yeah. I made myself put it back in because it's not fair yeah so it's really easy to do sure well and also you just want to make sense of it yeah in also my- to me I'm like obviously this but it's not obvious also. I feel like she would have had, and maybe no one's talking about this part because it would be so disrespectful of the dead. Did she have any signs of any mental illness before this stalking thing started? Because if not, if she was just regular pants and going about her day and handling things, then that idea it is so easy to call somebody crazy and be like oh this is a thing oh i can write this off because it's something she's just doing it to herself yeah which is like but what like what for well it's a real that's a great question and what's frustrating too about this case which probably makes it so interesting too is that you really only have these facts of her stop of what happened to her after her divorce so we don't know i couldn't find anything about her before she met her husband right so it's hard to tell the psychiatrist that she went to when she got committed said that there was it's from past trauma so who the fuck knows what that means um and she had this you know like everyone's saying that she had this traumatic life event with her divorce but they by all accounts were had an amicable separation so it doesn't seem like it was totally traumatic right well, and also one of the things that that psychiatrist said, it sounded like was something along the lines of multiple per- possible multiple personality, mm-hmm. which they've proven isn't a real right, thing. Right. So there's those things where like 19, there's a lot of like 1980s old school shit terms. Of I just think cutting your phone line is such a dramatic Why thing to do. Why cutting your to, phone line? To like, to, to you, it fucks things up. It's, you don't just get your phone turned back on. Yeah. Like that's kind of, you won't have a landline in the eighties for like two weeks until they come and fix it. Well, maybe she fucking likes that. Cause then she can't get these calls anymore. I mean, I'm not okay, like, I don't know. I, but that's, yeah, that's dramatic and people have to come to your aid and it is a big deal. And so, but it also isn't harming you. So it's this like someone cut my phone lines. Seems like a big deal. It's the same thing as like, I guess nowadays it'd be someone stole my phone, right? right. Or whatever. Yeah. Right. So it, all these things are these things that are, I, I'm, I don't know which one it is and right. I, I can't say so. It, I can see the point of why it's, why she would do these things to herself for attention. It makes sense to me. Yeah. I just, don't, it doesn't, the attention part doesn't make sense. Although I'm not denying that's a thing people get. Yeah. Where it's almost like, then the ambulance came and it was so exciting or whatever. But yeah, it just seems like well, to me, it's, it's so much more likely a woman, especially a woman, if she looked like something like Vanna White in the 80s or 90s, had a stalker and a person who was yeah. trying to make her go crazy and torture her. But how how did they find no trace of him for six and a half years? Well, to me, it sounds like I mean, uh, clearly out that the cops discounted her really early and so didn't bother looking for shit also could, could have been that could have been that the, the the stalker was a cop and knew all the inside shit well we got some shit then to talk about oh shit y'all all right because also that thing where you when you said the thing about the dogs not getting a scent but they have to know what they're smelling right. for to do it in the first place right. so yeah if it's only her smell they need a sock from the person they suspect like you i don't yeah. they don't just find a scent and run to a person no that makes to- that's very true i only know that from our friend and someone knows something. I know all about those. You should be dogs. a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. <laughs> oh, I will. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of suspects. Mm-hmm. All right. Constable Pat McBride was the first investigator to look into Cindy's claims way back in 1982. He ended up getting involved with her romantically pretty quickly and, and and moved in with her for a brief period their relationship ended when he asked her to marry him and she said no okay so he was a fucking cop and spurned but he was one of the only police who believed and supported her that she had a stalker oh. but it's like of course you're like no yeah i totally believe it you know yes that's the perfect hiding place. right but maybe to his friends he was like she's fucking crazy she's a nut. yeah um and he, so he was looked into as a suspect and cleared. Four years after Cindy's death, Pat pleaded guilty to two incidents of sexually assaulting women. Uh oh. And he had been under psychiatric care since 1984 because of a personality disorder. 
Okay. Which is like, I mean, who isn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, you would hope not all police right. people and right. people that are supposed to uphold the law. Right. Jesus H. So he was looked into and cleared, but that's some that's some shit to consider. Right that's there. a real swamp. Yes. Uh-huh. Also, okay, here's the, okay, here's the fun part. This isn't fun. Here's the part. Uh, when Cindy was under hypnosis at one point to try to remember who had attacked her in more details, she had a memory of being on a trip with her ex-husband, Dr. Makepeace, shortly before their divorce. They were with a doctor named James Tyhurst, uh, and she said she witnessed them doing something sinister, including cutting up bodies, like had killed people and were cutting up bodies. She remembered that during hypnosis. Hmm. So it turns out this fucking dude, Dr. James Tyhurst, look him up, T-Y-H-U-R-S-T, he was, had been sexually abusing his, some of his female patients, and he was arrested just four months after Cindy's death. And in 1991, he was convicted on five counts of sexual and indecent assault and ended up paying one of his victims half a million dollars in damages. Holy he shit. would, he was one of those psychiatrists that would do that thing where he would make them sign a fucking master and slave thing to be like, you have daddy issues here to, here's how to get past them. Like, you need to let me take over your life. And then some occasions he would like have them take their shirt off and whip them. Holy he was like a fuck. fucking psychopath. Whoa. And he was a psychiatrist. And le- and basically leading these women to believe he was, was healing them. Part of their process. Fuck. Yeah. Dark. So here we go. Conspiracy theory time. Because I just finished fucking Wormwood on Netflix. <laughs> which I highly recommend yeah. everyone watches all the way through. It's so good. It's so good. Okay. So I totally believe this part. Dr. Tyhurst worked with the CIA in the 1950s Uh uh uh-huh, in experiments involving brainwashing, including he worked on a project called Project Artichoke, which turned into <laughs> MK Ultra. Oh, Jesus. MK Ultra started as Project Artichoke. Artichoke. <laughs> so for everyone who doesn't know, the project studied hypnosis, Forced morphine addiction. What? She died from a fucking morphine overdose. That's right, she did. Did I say morphine? Yes, you did. And uh, and they also studied the subsequent forced withdrawal of morphine and the use of chemicals, including LSD, to, to, to produce amnesia and other vulnerable states in subjects. Fucking A. Go watch Wormwood if you think that that's bullshit. <laughs> right fucking now. Georgia will fight you. I will fight you. I just want to be in the meeting where people are like, look, we're doing some pretty great sinister shit. <laughs> we're dosing everyone with acid. We're making people pretend to commit suicide. We cannot call ourselves Project Artichoke anymore. <laughs> it doesn't suit us. It doesn't suit the well, project. The, but what, and then one guy goes, what about the layers? You peel one artichoke uh, <laughs> like leaf off. And they're like, Stanley, you've had your time at the table. Now we're talking about the future. MK Ultra or bust. And they're like, that sounds creepy. That All is, I want is for future fucking true crime podcasts to have a cool name and not laugh at Project Artichoke. That's right. MK Ultra it is. But now... So I want a project artichoke. But that's, <laughs> my own. that's our new fucking business venture. <laughs> project also happens to be Elvis's favorite food, artichokes. <laughs> it's a fucking full circle. D- so did she witness her husband and they broke up pretty quickly after and fuck Dr. Tyburn fucking doing some sinister shit. And Dr. Tyburn is like, well, I'm going to fucking mind control the shit out of her for six and a half years so yep. she doesn't no one believes what she's saying and we make her seem like a totally crazy woman that would do this thing voluntarily mm-hmm. to get attention therefore she has no credibility with her family with her friends do we with- call it fucking constable pat mcbride and, and give him ten thousand dollars to be in on it this goes all the way to oh, the middle, middle of the artichoke <laughs> oh no uh, dip this shit in garlic butter and oh. put it to fucking bed god that's- so either way, if she if she was doing it herself, which I believe 60 percent, she didn't know she was doing it. It's horrible and sad. So you think it was a puppet master situation where she it wasn't she wasn't doing it because of a psychotic break or some kind of thing. It was because of that. No, I think she I think she had some severe mental illness that dissociative identity I don't know what by I don't know what and listen everyone knows I'm not fucking saying that people who are who have 
mental illness are fucking crazy because right. I have hi I have mom. Uh, welcome <laughs> welcome to my life but I, I it does seem like there's a lot of uh, a lot of everything that happened can be reasoned that she was doing these things to herself and didn't know about it and if that's true how sad is it that she had to live through that of it's her own mental horrifying. illness. If it's fucking not true and there was someone doing these things to her and no one believed her and thought she was crazy, how fucking sad is that? Every direction. It's it's an insane case and I don't think we'll ever know because, you know, there's just not, there's not enough. Especially if you start to link it to the CIA or MKUltra or something that you can, these days it feels more and more like, oh yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some de- some. Well, they did this dark- shit, man. Like, yeah. They really did. They really did it. Have I mentioned Wormwood? <laughs> Do I have to say it again? How many times? But it's funny because I've heard this story about her and you really, not you personally, the story gets told really with this thing of like, here's this horrible thing, but also isn't even, isn't even crazier if she was doing it to herself. Yeah. So you almost get served this um, worst case scenario. You know what I mean? Like it's a yeah. more interesting story if she was doing it to herself or it's a more, it's a twist. It's, I think what's so interesting about it is that nobody knows and it feels awful either way, either, either place you land on it, it feels awful yeah. because she still, you know, she still was tormented. And, and no matter what. Right. I'm just saying you don't cut your own phone line. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying no one cuts a landline. First of all, how do you even fucking do I it? I love that the thing that you have fucking a problem with. It's the only thing that I have in this life. It's But it's so like, for people who have never had landlines or didn't, didn't rely on them, yep. you don't know how serious you are about this. It's kind of like how, I don't know if it's still this way, but like, I mean, I don't know if it's like a known thing or whatever, but it's like, you just couldn't get anybody to get anything taken care of in a short amount of time. Yeah. So that whole thing of like the window is between Tuesday and Friday and they'll come whenever they feel like yeah. it. I don't know. For something like a phone, I just don't see it happening. Also, the other day I was sitting at home and all of a sudden my power went out. And of course, the first thing I think is I didn't pay yeah, my bill. Yeah, everyone thinks that. <laughs> and But then it came back on and then it went off again. <laughs> and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. I was just laying there watching TV. I was like scared like white hot scared because i'm like someone's outside turning my power off oh my god and or the bomb drop finally yeah or <laughs> i took it more of a a one-on-one i was oh. gonna have to like get into a knife fight with somebody but this just shows what the things we're scared about <laughs> yes and they're always with us and they're always there and xanax doesn't help it do- well you c- it'll still happen and you just don't register right. anything well there's so many nuances to this case too and i urge people to go to fucking reddit and the unexplained uh message boards and just look look up everyone's theories because it's so interesting yeah everyone has these theories and then they and every comment is fucking yeah but you know and it's and they're all right it's just yeah it seems like it could truly be it could go any direction yeah, like people right. answered the phone when they were at her house with her standing there and no one was on the line yeah but no one ever answered the phone and there was someone talking on the line you know what i mean it's like oh that kind of thing yeah. also i really fucking hated that phone call like oh, somebody I thought you would. That's why I played it. Somebody's standing there trying to be threatening. It's like, it's not the voice or whatever. It's the idea that a person is on the other line thinking to do that to someone. Who's trying to scare the shit out of you. Yeah. It's just so fucking weird. Soon phones won't exist. That's yeah. the dream. Talking to anyone won't exist. Just let's... It, It'll e- all be podcasts. Text. Text me like two emojis. Get it. Get the idea across. If and you want to tell me out. anything... Make a podcast. <laughs> podcast about it. Send me the podcast. If it doesn't get, un- if it gets under top 10 in iTunes, I'll listen to what you have to say. Nice. To okay. Mom. Yeah, that's good. Mom. What time? You'll you want support. to know what time? What time? Make a podcast about it. <laughs> Tell me in a podcast. Uh, so that's the story of Cindy James and her death. Wow, that's fascinating. I definitely have heard of it before, but I didn't know her yeah. by name. But it's funny because the way you said that and Unsolved Mysteries style, right? It was mm-hmm. on Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah. My Murder Today <gasps> is also one that I was like, hey, whatever happened to that story? <gasps> Love it. Did one of those. Yeah. Um, and also I did, and this I understand I'm, I've been leaning on a lot lately, but 
who fucking cares? Um, <laughs> it's our fucking podcast. My, uh, the way I'm trying to find stories is to go on iTunes and then just look under true crime and see what they have, like what, because the ID channel at, at this point now, they have every water feature style murder. It's like swamp murders and pool <laughs> murders and fucking uh, a shallow puddle. And somehow they're able to turn it into a half an hour show when it's really like the husband killed her. Right. But it's but because it, in essence, yeah. it's so fascinating that you don't you don't need much. So I can't keep up with a lot of those ones. Yeah. Um, but there's a really good one. Water feature. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take a minute? For the water feature, you know what? It, it comes up in the story. Oh, That's great. why it was on the on the top of my head. Love but um, James Patterson has a new like a uh, reenactment crime series mm -hmm. that I found. Like I think I stumbled upon. I highly recommend it. <gasps> what is that? He's at the top. He does this goofy introduction. You know, James Patterson is the novelist, and he like he has his own commercials. Where he'll be like, "My new book will drive you crazy." He looks like someone's grandpa. Mm -hmm. So I started watching this because I'm like, I bet this is going to be real cheesy. Mm -hmm. It is so wonderfully produced and acted mm -hmm. and really well written. And they're true. They're true crimes. They're like, it's not uh, fictionalized. Is it called Waterfall Murders? It's <laughs> what water feature? <laughs> it's called Who Didn't Turn Off the Hose? <laughs> Drinking my, my dad murdered everybody in the house because you left the hose on. Drinking overnight. poison out of a hose. <laughs> you, hot water out of a green Ugh, garden, garden hose. hose. Wait, okay. what's the what's the show called? James Patterson colon Stephen's going to tell us in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I see him pick oh, up his I phone. I love that you did. I love that you tried to avoid it. Because I was like, wait, Karen, tell us. I didn't help you. I'm I sorry. just put it into my TiVo, though. So I thought if I started to say James Patterson, the rest would come out. It doesn't do that in it, real life. No. We don't have TiVos in our brains yet. It doesn't. Um, I, I'll, just, uh, I'll read uh, it. Uh, it's uh, called Murder is Forever. Yeah, and, uh, it, and that's really true. I mean... How many times have we told you guys? Whew. But it, now that James Patterson's saying it, he's right. So um, he's yeah. good. But right. there was another one I found. And okay. this is what got me to this story. So also, we know People Magazine right there and always has been with the true crime. Forefront. Re at the forefront. For, like, has been all over John Benet's death since it happened. That's what they, they did do. it. That's what they do. And now they're devoted and they have a dedicated team. Mm -hmm. So. This is uh, the mixed day family murder. <gasps> You're doing it. I'm doing it. Oh, I love it. Oh, the mixed days. It makes me so crazy because when I saw this was one of the choices, when I was looking at all the choices for the People Magazine Investigates, it was that thing where I went, oh, I remember that. I remember that happening. I remember it being breaking news here in LA. I remember them talking about, oh, if this family of four went missing. And then the follow-up reports in like the following, say, month or so, they all led and told this weird story where I started to go, oh, they probably brought it on themselves. Oh, they probably, oh, they're escaping they did something. This, they did this, they did this. They did it to themselves or they're running away because they're the criminals. Right. Really, that narrative got into like the media pretty strongly. Yeah. And then it made me go, oh, well, then they probably just ran away and they're yeah. tax evaders or some weird thing. And then I just never heard anything else about it. So when I saw it come up as that choice, I was like, I bet you that ended way different than I remember. Mm -hmm. And I need to know what the whole story is. Oh, this one hurts. It's bad. And it's Southern California, of course. So it's Fallbrook, California, which is 100 miles north of San Diego. So it's that weird space between... Oh, 100 miles north. Yeah. So you know, like, as you go down uh, towards San Diego and there's like Temecula yeah. and whatever. It's right, I think it's right south of Temecula from what I remember. I looked at the map a couple times. Um, but it's basically oh. kind of just, I know I can read maps. <laughs> Google Maps. Okay, so Joey and Summer McStay are happily married couple. He, uh, he designs custom-made water features. That's, oh my God. That's why that was in my head. Um, oh fucking circle a full circle um so basically it's like these really high end it's it's kind of an amazing business and you know people like that that are like they're artists but then they applied their art mm -hmm. to actually make something functional that people need so it's like water fountains and water features that were all like, um like waterfalls in the pool that go into the pool because exactly. you're rich as fuck and you just need more shit in your house yes. very high end business it reminds me of something that would be like a now an hgtv show totally the mixed day family 
water features. They bring in, they're the specialists that the like, uh, those weird Las Vegas rent brothers bring in. The property brothers? The rent brothers. <laughs> They're, the rental brother. They're a little bit uh, more uh, low down than, than the, the property brothers. brothers. Okay. Property brothers are about buying. The property brothers are like, we're not going to fucking Las Vegas, dude. That's right. Yeah. The rent brothers are like, yeah, if you have a part time job and you love beer, we're your guys. Yeah. Okay. Las Vegas is where to go. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, so jo- that's what Joey does for a living. Mm-hmm. It really fancy, great business that he started himself and that just is doing better and better. And so mm-hmm. they just bought this really nice house in, uh, Fallbrook. Um, and, uh, Summer is a full time, uh, real estate agent. So they're doing very well mm-hmm. and they have two young sons, mm-hmm. um, a five year old, um, and a three year old. So they, uh, on February, um, I believe it's around like February 8th or 10th, mm-hmm. um, Joey is what everyone calls him. Joey McStay's father, Patrick, notices that he's not answering his calls. Every time he calls Joey, he get, it goes straight to the mailbox is full. Um, he cannot get a hold of him. And he finally calls his other son, Michael, and says, will you go check on Joey in the house? Cause he's not answering, mm-hmm. um, like what's going on. And then they start getting calls, complaints of people that are looking for, um, their water features or their orders or say, want a question or whatever and no one's answering so Mm. and joey was a really astute businessman so they knew once they started hearing complaints through emails that that like calls weren't being returned that's when they really started getting worried Mm -hmm. that something was going on because it's just not like him um and actually the webmaster for joey's company was the one that Mm. called and said i got all these emails it's like he's i can't get a hold of him so then the whole family kind of gets together and Michael, Joey's brother, and then Joey's business partner, who is the guy that took the designs and actually made the water features. Mm-hmm. His name is um, Chase Merritt. Um, he's like the construction dude. Yeah. He's like, he, you you design it on the paper, then I take all the tubes, twist it around, make a water feature. Got it. We Boom. ship it out. Boom. We all make $10,000. <laughs> um they go over to the mixed day's new house and they're looking around they see that the family that joey's truck is in the in the driveway but that the family car is gone mm-hmm. they the family car is an isuzu trooper and it's not there um they look they look over the back fence the dogs are out in the backyard mm-hmm. they haven't been fed mm-hmm. they're um they're like going crazy that people are actually there and then michael finds an open window and he goes into the mixed day's house and they look around and there's no blood anywhere there's nothing amiss there doesn't look like there's been a struggle but it looks like people were just there five minutes ago so there's two little bowls of popcorn on the couch that are just sitting on the couch um there's glasses on the counter um you know uh, reading glasses sitting on the counter there's open cans of paint Mm -hmm. from a room that they were you know read like repainting they were open no one leaves a can of paint open not even if they were gonna run to the corner it's like what if the dogs get in or the kids yeah. I'm so anal retentive about that shit. There's no fucking way you're just leaving those. And I don't have dogs or kids. Right. And they said, um, later on, they say that they're the kind of people that they would brought their dogs everywhere. So yeah. they wouldn't, Aww. like, the idea that the dogs were out in the yard, not fed, is, like, re- was really upsetting to them. They yeah. knew something was terribly wrong. Sure. On February 15th, the family reports the entire family missing to the San Diego Sheriff's um, Department. Mm-hmm. Um they've because they try to contact him in every way they look they look everywhere and they're like no this is like we need the police to start investigating this so the police narrow it down to the last any anybody heard from them and the last um like traceable um like phone activity was on february 4th uh, Mm -hmm. of 2010 and february 15th is when they got a hold of the cops yes wow so they uh yeah they it basically was like oh they're so busy they're just not getting back to us and then it got to the point where it's like somebody's got to look into this so i think and also february 15th was like may have been the official day that it started so they could have been talking to the cops the second after they went into the house and it looked like everyone had just walked out of the room which is such a creepy feeling but anyway um so they see that uh they that on uh february 4th at 8 28 p.m um a cell phone tower 
pinged Joseph's phone. He had uh, made a call to employee an employee in Rancho Cucamonga to talk about work. Um, and then they find out that a neighbor, their neighbor had a surveillance camera that caught the edge of the mixed days driveway. Mm -mm. And so they have video footage of the mixed mix days <laughs> Isuzu trooper backing out of the driveway at 747 PM on the night of February 4th. Oh my God, I forgot about that part. Yeah. But you can't see. So all you can see are the wheels going down yeah. a driveway. You don't even see where the windows are on the wow. car. It doesn't go up high enough. So you can't see who's in the car. Yeah. Yeah. But you just see that the trooper is leaving the house. Um, and then uh, on February 8th, they find the family's 1996 Isuzu trooper. Uh, it had been towed from a parking lot near San Ysidro. And the security guards later tell investigators it may have been parked there uh, sometime between 5.30, and, uh, 5:30 p.m. and 7 p.m. And... Um, so then they start looking. It's basically a parking lot that's right next to the border. So then they start watching video footage because they're like, well, what if the family just went into Mexico and something happened? Because that's basically yeah. what they're, the car being driven there tells them that. Yeah. So then they find what this. What year is this again? I'm sorry. This was n uh, 2010. Okay. So, um, so. And, and I know that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I should have questioned you. I guarantee it. <laughs> I wrote the year down on every single one of these lines. No, so... Um, <laughs> So they start looking at video footage and they think they have found around eight o'clock on that night. They think they found it's like surveillance footage of people walking into Mexico from the California side into Mexico. And it's a family of four and it's a guy and a girl and then a, two little children. I have watched I back then watched that video over and over and paused it and started it and paused it and it's just shadows it's shadows you can't tell really who it is and away. it's walking away so you don't see their faces but it looks like a husband and a wife and two little boys and it actually is probably it could be i mean like they were saying something where it's like both of the little boys had these hats on right. like beanies and which is what those little boys did wear all the time what do they call them and not uh Tooks, Tooks in Canada, yeah, yeah, or like not in California. Yeah, beanies here, but Be yeah, or you know, some just kind of a little hat. Yeah, but the thing is, lots of little kids wear yeah. those. So it's it's that thing where it's but like, what are the chances of that same night at that same time? These, and this happened. They look. You know, it's far away, but it's like she's age skinny. appropriate. It's yeah. all they they fit the body types, all of it. They do. So then the police find on um, Summer's computer in uh, looking into like from Jan the beginning of January searches on. Do you need uh, passports to take children across the That's border right. into Mexico and different questions like that about taking kids there. So then they were like, OK, maybe this they've been planning some kind of escape. And that's where this part of the narrative comes in. Yeah. Um, and then the father says in the People magazine investigates, the father talks about how um, Joey, because he was doing so well in business and stuff, he ended up buying land in Belize mm -hmm. because he had this retirement plan. He loved surfing and he loved the water. And so he had this land he was going to build like a house on in Belize for when they were done and they just wanted to go down and, you know, live the easy life. Well, he, yeah. And he looked like the Margaritaville dude. Let's yes. He's very Sammy Hagar. He's guy. like a, he's like a young Sammy Hagar. She's this like beautiful, like looks like she hang out at the beach all the time. Totally. She yeah. has like share hair. Yeah. They're both like surfy, chill out looking. The kids are like sweet. Young so be those little boys look like the cutest kids. Yeah. And they, yeah, it's just like a very beautiful. It's a very Southern California family. So Southern California. Yeah. Just kind of like we've and successful. Yeah. Doing well because they've worked hard. Yeah. Yeah. So then this idea that the seeding this concept in that they somehow were on the run or they were trying to get away from something or whatever. Then they start theorizing, OK, was the cartel involved in this water feature company mm -hmm. where if they were sh exporting mm -hmm. that somehow they got they ran into like the wrong element exporting these water features into Mexico sure. or internationally or something where they're just trying to theorize of like, why would you run with your whole family totally. or why would you cross over into Tijuana and just disappear? Like what could be happening? Yeah. Um, it's like 
it, I get it. It makes sense that that's one of the things you think about. Sure. Well, and I also think that sometimes those people come up with those theories because they're trying to think, how can this family still be alive? Right. Because the real, the underlying creepiness is you don't, you want to go, there's got to be some other thing that's happening. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, on May 13th of 2010. So this is like, uh, you know, February, February March, March, April, April three months later, uh-huh. um, there, they send investigators down to El Rosario, Mexico, because so a waiter sees, sees little kid, sees the birthmark and reports it that he think this is, this is the kid. Cause now their pictures are everywhere yeah. and it's, and it's missing family. Yeah. There's no, uh, homicide element in the, obviously in the beginning of this. It's like, have um, you seen case. this family? So yeah. it's these, and also it seems like when those pictures of like, have you seen this family? They're it immediately puts them in that they could be criminals. Yeah. Or there's something questionable about like, you know, well, how does all, a whole family disappear unless they're doing it on their own? Unless they're it's not like a husband and wife or one yes. or the other. It's changing like, their identity or whatever. Yeah. It's like, yeah, they obviously You don't usually run away with a three year old and a five year old. Right. So a bunch of they have sent seven investigators down to look into this. Um, but nothing uh nothing came of that. And then the brother Michael starts um the Mc, find the McFay Mc uh stay family website and um it gets a bunch of attention and they actually did an uh they featured the story on America's Most Wanted. Um just saying this family has mm-hmm. disappeared and nobody knows what's happening. Gosh. Um the problem is that the the family finds that in their personal bank accounts they have a hundred thousand dollars. So they're like, "Why would you escape and leave behind a bunch of money?" And it's not touched this right. whole time. It's just sitting in their bank account. That, I remember that amount being like, like if they left ten thousand dollars and didn't touch it, it'd be like they're you know okay like you, if you're trying to make it seem like you didn't run away but you left that right. hundred thousand fucking dollars why wouldn't you bring that if you're on the run right and you're never coming back yeah. it doesn't make sense it's so much money um then uh they also find that summer had um in her email the family starts going through the email uh their personal email and finds um, that her abusive ex was a guy named Vic Johansson. She hadn't spoken him, to him in five years. And actually, she was like the bad, that was the bad relationship she was coming out of when she mm. met Joey. And they were like, and he like turned her life around and it was suddenly like, I believe in love again type of thing. So they find an email from that guy. They hadn't spoken in five years. And the email was, they didn't like, like the tone of it or the sound of it. So suddenly they're like, where's this guy? Yeah. So they start looking into Vic Johansson and it turned out in the time that they had uh, broken up, he'd been arrested twice. Once was for threatening to kill his neighbors mm. and claiming that he was a, um, a Marine who was trained in like, killing people and so like i'm coming for you mm-hmm. he was arrested for that then the other time and more recently he was arrested because he was re- refused to leave a bar that joey's store was it was next to joe's joey's what? store and so they were like and then they find out that that Vic Johansson lives in an apartment two miles away no. from joey and summer's old apartment Oh shit! So they're like, "Oh, this guy's in the mix," and nobody For sure. knew it. For sure, or understood it. Um, uh, but then Vic knows that he's going to be su- suspect, and so he calls the police preemptively yeah. and says, "I understand they're missing. I just want to let you know this is where I was. Yeah, uh, here's all the people that can prove it, and it all proves out. So he has an alibi um, that seems to be solid." Mm-hmm. Um, by August of 2010, the beginning of August of 2010, the family just starts taking um, all the mixed days stuff out of their house. Mm. Um, and then uh, they see that. Um, so Joey's company was called Earth Inspired Products. Mm-hmm. That, that was the custom made water features. Um, they see that the company is for sale for a million dollars. And the CEO listed mm. is Dan Kavanaugh. The webmaster. Uh, Shut the fuck up. Who had set up the email when the company first started. I'm not sorry, the website, not the email. <laughs> I'm so old. Um, so basically, the, in, you know, in this, in People Magazine Investigates, mm-hmm. they say that Dan Kavanaugh s- believed that he was one of the main reasons that this 
uh, water feature company got so successful because he made sure that anytime you searched custom water features or any, he was like one of those early Google manipulators. Mm -hmm. So that um, earth uh, inspired products Inc. would come up first yeah. when you were searching for that. And because of that, they got all this business and he felt like he never got his fair share. Mm -hmm. And they found old IMs of Joey and Dan like fighting and mm -hmm. Dan saying, you owe me money. And so Joey ended up buying him a BMW to like Whoa. as a uh, thank you for all your service and I'm doing well and yeah. you know, you helped me. Um, so and Steven, they, don't get any ideas. <laughs> Steven, the BMWs are too fast for you. <laughs> Um, you go kart. nodding yes <laughs> um, and also they tracked that he had kept coming to Joe this webmaster kept coming to Joey and being like lend me 50 bucks lend me 100 bucks lend me 200 bucks so that you know they were like really starting to look at that guy and then he was like I was on a surfing trip what when that family just mm, likely you can look story. it up story well they you know they it did. was the truth oh. but <laughs> i think it's insane that he tried to fucking sell that company with himself as the ceo For like sure dude what an idiot what are you doing red flag and also the case is still open like why yeah. would you put yourself out there so um anyway that basically all of those leads go cold the whole case goes cold for three years then on april 9th 2013 oh my god um Basically, because of that surveillance video, yeah, with the, the, which one the at at um sorry at the border, the border uh -huh. uh, with the family grainy from the back uh, saying it's them. Yeah, the San Diego Sheriff's Department investigators announced that the McStay family left for Mexico voluntarily. <gasps> they're like done. Yes, so. so they come out and they're just basically like, look, they're gone, and we don't know what happened. Say and goodbye. They they just went to Mexico. Oh, shit. So oh, how frustrating for the family. It's terrible and. Also, so this is April of 2013. In November of 2013, April to November, got it right. I'm, I'm a, there. A solid six months, okay, or so. Um, I don't know math. I mean, it, we could just pause it and add it up. But well. <laughs> why would we? So it's not this pod. This isn't a maths podcast. <laughs> British math. This isn't an accounting podcast. <laughs> For fuck's sake, this is not a calendar podcast. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> on November 11th, 2013, okay. there's a guy riding in the desert, the Mojave Desert. He's riding a motorcross area. Best, that's, it's your new boyfriend. It's Jimmy Buttons. He's just, he Jimmy wants to Buttons. get back on the bike and just kind of experience the old time. Sure. Um, he's out there and he hits, <gasps> his tire hits something no. weird. He goes back. No. It's a human skull. No. Yes. He calls 911. I'm pretty sure it's the real call that was on people magazine shut up what does he say what does he say he just goes yeah um i'm running my motorcycle out here back behind the dump and uh i think i just found a human skull holy like, shit like he just sounds like the most bummed out motocross uh, guy like, of all time i just wanted to fucking top some wheelies yeah i'm just trying to have fun like a kid because you know how hard life can be sometimes <laughs> and um i found a skull. I, bought, I saved some money and i bought this thing for myself because it brings me joy and it's yeah. the only thing i have that and, brings uh, me joy left and of course death is around every corner sure and uh, we all know that so can i get some help out here so i found a skull <laughs> oh the poor jimmy but now here's the thing okay jimmy buttons xoxo um the san bernardino sheriff's office takes over because uh -huh. it's up it's the the where that skull is found is up in the desert and it's not in it like it's not san diego right. sheriff's office it's anymore a different place and so san it's two separate it's counties two different places so san bernardino's like yeah we got this mm -hmm. everybody else can back it yeah you remember san out. diego how you were like no they walked away they walked into san diego Tijuana. san bernardino's like uh yeah they're like so we're on this and they send um forensic investigators to the to the site including an anthropologist nice and they work all night and into the morning and then the next day no. november 15th san bernardino county sheriff john mcmahon identifies the bodies found as joseph summer joseph and gianni mixed day mm. the whole fucking family's been murdered how did they know it was them when they were digging because they the bo lots of bones were broken but they had the dental records and the dental oh, records and, identified everybody but they wouldn't know to check the dental records until they knew how, what to check them against yeah because there's two adult bodies and two children and two child bodies oh god and two separate graves oh so tell me what happened so awful okay so the family's house is 
been sold. There's a new family living in the house. So the San Bernardino uh, County Sheriff's want to go back in, but then they're like, but anything that could have been in here yeah. that could have possibly been a clue is gone. Um, but the Isuzu Trooper is still <gasps> in, I guess, somehow in police custody. Mm-hmm. So they go back and they fucking pull every ounce of forensic uh, evidence that they can out of it. And what they find <gasps> is there is trace evidence <gasps> of Joey's business partner, Chase Merritt, <gasps> in the fucking Isuzu Trooper. Trooper. So they start to look into Chase Merritt's uh, Ch- Chase Chase, Chase Merritt. Merritt's merits <laughs> and his demerits. Um, <laughs> turns out he's an ex-con with a mile-long rap sheet. Oh, Chase! You've he, been chased down. That's right. So many words that are other words. Your chase has come to an. I don't know. There's something there. Uh, so he had served time for burglary, grand theft, receiving stolen property, and he also had a gambling problem. Mm. So uh, as Joey's company was getting more and more successful, he was borrowing larger and larger sums of money from Joey. Mm-mm. And by 2010, uh, Chase Merritt owed Joey over $30,000. Holy shit. Yes. And when Summer found out that amount that that he owed she was like what the fuck are you doing like that you that's too much money to lend somebody and that's crazy yeah and i think he i think joey was in that position where he had all the success and all this like money and everything was going great so all the people that had that came and were like yeah well you owe me because he'd be like sure here how much do you need and was really generous and just wanted everyone to be like happy Mm -hmm. like he was Um, and it was like he's grateful for everything he has and so he's making yeah. sure he's paying it for paying it to people who helped him get right there. exactly and chase Merritt's there going well i'm your i'm your business partner and right. i'm your guy and i just have this little please hold me over for a little while i just need ten thousand yeah. dollars so basically as they continue to look in they know summer was really upset about that amount she wanted to talk about it like that it was like a real issue um then they look at Chase Merritt's phone records, and on the night the McStay family went missing, um, his cell phone was shown being used right near where the bodies were no. found. And they found out that Merritt's sister lived close to that <gasps> location as well. They had grown up. It was, I think, near Victorville. It was uh-huh. like Mojave Desert somewhere. Uh-huh. Um, basically, that's where he knew the area very well. Oh. So Why didn't they know that before? I know. They didn't look into it. Yeah. I guess uh, because they were like, oh, they, they, they there they are away. in Mexico. Yeah. Everything. It, that's fine. Um, so then uh, I like to think forensic accountants found this out, but I don't know who did. It I bet been they did. Else. Some super exciting, wonderfully dressed, chic, hot, exciting. So cool. Forensic accountants. Yeah. Uh, find that Chase Merritt had written a company check for the amount of twenty one thousand dollars after the mixed days went missing oh shit which is just fucking stupid yeah um so i would think that would be the last straw but the chronology could be wrong so any number of those things could have been the last sure. straw. finding out that his sister lived nearby all those things yeah. but basically they're like oh yeah okay so on november 7th 2014 uh, san bernardino county sheriff's investigators uh announced that they have arrested Ch- uh, Charles Chase Merritt and he's charged with four counts of murder in the mixed day slayings. Okay, so prosecutors allege Chase Merritt has a gambling problem. He killed the family for financial gain and basically he wrote checks totally more than $21,000 on Joseph McStay's business account in the days after the family was killed. Ugh. Then he went on a gambling spree at Dude. nearby casinos. Which one, Morongo? I bet it was Morongo. Go, go, Morongo. Don't do it. Uh, where of course he lost thousands of dollars Dude, on what what are they gambling on uh, you know fucking like buffalo my buffalo machine high stakes buffalo machine B- high stakes buffalo and fucking wheel of fortune it's machine. just like that thing of like anything else where you're like so you you couldn't stop playing fucking 21 so you yeah. killed four people including two little babies babies like the cutest yeah. so what a monster on january 30th 2015 chase Merritt requests to re- represent himself oh, always a good sign great idea you're fucking sane as shit uh he said he only had six to eight months to live that he couldn't afford an attorney and he had to represent himself so oh. this turns out is very sad for him i hate him so much so the trial is delayed um because he re- keeps on firing these attorneys and 
He tries to represent represent himself, and I'm sure he couldn't do it. Uh, February 2016, he had already gone through five attorneys. Shit. July 2017, his trial is tentatively set for September 25th, 2017. A month later, a San Bernardino County Superior Court judge sets a November 13th, 2017 trial date. November 13th, 2017, the trial is waived. Wait, that's like a couple months ago. Until February 23rd, <gasps> the trial starts tomorrow. <laughs> the trial of Chase Merritt, Shut who your face. fucking killed the McStay family, starts tomorrow. If they don't waive it again. Holy shit. Yeah. Let's go to it. Dude, and the the cool thing about the way People Magazine Investigates set up that thing was I was like, oh, it's totally that ex-boyfriend, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you go, it's totally the webmaster. Well, I'm like that webmaster. too with anything I watch. It's them. It's that. Like, it's the next person. But that within that world, the police had so much yeah. work to do and so many people to like peel away. Yeah. Um, the really awful thing, though, is this family... W- there, um, Joey McStay had electrical cord around his neck, but the whole family was bludgeoned to death. Oh my god! And they found the um, it's you know the sledgehammer where the bodies were buried. How did he do it? Right, and like they he he whoever did this, and if it was him or somebody else, sledgehammer to death a family. Like it's it's a monster among us. It's so horrifying. Oh. Oh my god! Yeah, it's just like I think what always bothered me, and I I followed this case obviously not until recently because I didn't know that was going on. But I think once I found out that their bodies were found, I was like, I can't this anymore because you'd been hearing so much about it. Yes, like I knew what happened. Okay, I'm done. But I've always pictured, you know, their house and the two bowls of popcorn, like little kid popcorn, yeah. on the couch they had just sat their kids down so they could watch something on tv with some popcorn and the theory is so that the parents could have a conversation with chase with the business partner to say hey you can't this can't happen anymore we're not doing this anymore and he fucking lost it and he or he was like oh we should all go to a let's all go out to dinner or let's all like something to get everybody together in the car because he, oh yeah there yeah, was so it like, happened it didn't happen in the house because there's no blood there's nothing yeah they don't and the uh, defense attorneys in the beginning were trying to say that the prosecution is trying to say that the uh that that's the house is where the like the initial attack took place and because there's not a drop of blood there that can't it must be wrong or whatever mm-hmm. when obviously I, it, there's because there was no broken glass, there was no doors were broken, there was no forced entry, there was no sign of a struggle. They left of their own accord with the business partner slash friend that they thought everything was fine. That they with. trusted. Yes. So what do you? Where they don't know where the where the murder took place. But I think if he, I think it took place out in the desert. I think he got yeah. them into the car and then drove them against their will. Because yeah. Yeah, that makes sense that like, but then, yeah, but then you wonder like if the dad had then the uh, rope around his neck, because like he probably would have fought if this dude like brought out a gun and was like, you're coming with me. So he subdued him somehow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because I think it's that thing and all the people that are suspect, it's all these people that are your good friend, your business partner, the person you talk to every single day. So clearly it's someone couldn't be more on the inside totally. that turned and the idea that this this guy has like a rap sheet a mile long where clearly he doesn't have a huge problem with yeah breaking the law and doing what he needs to do to get his right i don't know it's i mean it's fascinating <gasps> and also just at the beginning and that was you know years years ago he was like oh i only have six months to live or it's like sorry what, what like you he said he had like what cancer or some shit I th- he like at first his lawyers were like yeah he's very unwell and then he fires the lawyers and is like i'm sick i'm just gonna represent myself oh like my it's just God. that whole psychopath thing of like this is about me and how hard yeah. the struggles of my life yeah and nobody else matters or counts Ugh. so well, crazy so we'll have to keep our eyes peeled and for sure see what happens in that case fuck man i know that was good karen thank you good well job. i'm just a I messenger you're just a messenger. <laughs> I don't want to take credit for the worst fucking story. You of don't all want time. to take credit for People Magazine investigates, uh, but but I will because man, that's a good show. Shit. Well, 
Oh, that's creepy. I also printed up a picture of the leaves. <laughs> that was what I was trying to print last week or the week we did oh, that. Oh, no. It's just reminding you about yeah. 2010. Never forget about 2010. Um, well, shit. Thank you for sharing that. Of me. course. Do you have a... Um, to, to wrap up the show, do you have some kind of a hooray? I do have one. Okay. You go first. Mine's stupid. I'll go first. Okay. And the other night I couldn't sleep. I was laying in bed thinking about the hometown murders and how crazy they've become. And I thought of another one that I want people to send in. So this is just a random... I, I want to hear this now. Okay. Okay. This is my hooray. Great. I want people to send me... Not me. I want people to send <laughs> us at my favorite murder at Gmail stories of how they found out after like grandpa died we went through the fucking basement yes and that's how we learned so there's this article in vice that i recently reread called my grandmother the poisoner by john reed that Ooh. i say everyone needs to read but like one of those yeah we realized my grandma might be poisoning all of us but we just acted like it was normal and like don't eat grandma's food but it's a really great <laughs> article what the fuck yeah so it's one of those what the fucks how did we not know we found out this after I want those. Those are our new hometowns that I want. Please. Right? And if anything involves an attic. An attic. Uh, we were going through a thing and we found out. Yes. Dot, dot, dot. And a trunk, microfiche, whatever it is. Anything. Bottom drawers. Yeah. Even anything. if it's like, and it doesn't have to be like murder. I'm just talking about like weird shit. Like we didn't realize this about my mom until or whatever the fuck. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I, I love those. that. I, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, I was going to say th this my hooray for this week is these fucking kids from that high school in Florida Ugh. who are standing up and fucking taking the mic away from these inept fucking leaders of this country and the rotten, shitty, toxic adults that are so fucking greedy that they don't care about human life anymore and they are taking it back. I am so proud that the way they're handling themselves. And I just want to say to all these kids that are watching other kids be this empowered and just know this is the world needs you so bad right now because these adults have gone insane and mm -hmm. you are the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And anyone trying to tell you, 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 you can't talk or you're being over emotional. You don't have to listen to any of those old fucks at all. And you can do you're not over emotional. Your opinion matters more than other people's because once you stand on the other side of a fucking AR 15 and almost die in your high school, you get to say what you think about gun control and your opinion matters. And you have to, you don't be stopped by fucking closed doors of senators and governors. Don't be stopped by internet trolls. Don't fucking fall for any of that shit and do what you know is right because those old fucks are uh, they're locked up in greed and they're locked up in fucking shitty like they don't even know what they're they've gone insane truly and we need you so badly right now so congratulations and i'm so sorry but also fuck yet yeah, like rise up children yes and i and even the, even the people who the, the teenagers who you haven't had a shooting at your school yet to me the thought you know I, I graduated the year before columbine and now the thought of going to high school knowing every fucking day that th that could happen is terrifying to yes. me and i'm not in high school yes. so everyone who's in high school and in college and in these in these situations like why why are why is the world the words school shooting so normal yeah shouldn't be no it's all these kids who need to fucking do something and you're totally right and it's not just the fucking people it's the adults as someone who's 37 we stop giving a shit and we go fucking dead in the brain and we don't know what we're what to do yes so you we need you so badly it's your fucking future we support you i saw something today that was like schools are fucking threatening to to um suspend students yeah i got suspended in high school guess what it doesn't fucking matter not only does it not matter but guess what? If you get shot by a fucking yeah. AR-15 because some fucking alt-right racist piece of shit runs through your school trying to shoot people, it won't matter, it won't matter. suspended or not. This is a, we are at a really crucial time where these what these kids are doing are standing up and going, no fucking more because we almost died. Yeah. They're not spoiled little activist children. No. They're not like these pieces of shit that are trying to talk shit about them. They, they are people who a survived 
and B, now have a clarity that you can only get when you fucking almost get killed, Mm -hmm. where you step forward and go, I know what matters. I know what doesn't matter. And I'm about to tell you something. And these old men that run this country that are so obsessed with being in a fucking yacht club that they don't give a shit about human life. That generation is dying off. I mean, I can't imagine how fucking scared the NRA is that they're coming after them. I am so fuck. We are fucking ruining for you. We're behind you. And also you're 17. A lot of you are 17 or up in that area. In one year, you can start fucking changing everything. Yeah. And you will. And in the meantime, your shit's going to be expunged. So just fucking get out there. Yes. And get arrested. And also, and keep going on social media. Keep yes. doing the things that you know how to do that they don't know how to do, yep. which is communicate on social media. There was that brilliant thing where people started to try to accuse one of those survivors of being a crisis actor. Yeah. And he fucking came back on Wolf Blitzer and was like, if any of you saw me in our high school productions of Fiddler on the Roof, you would know I am not a crisis actor. <laughs> That's it was amazing. like, how genius are these? They're all trained by TV. Yeah. They're all trained by social media. They know how to do this thing. They don't need fucking old people telling them what to do anymore. And they don't need pieces of shit like school people going, oh, you'll get suspended. Hey, guess what? We're tired. They're saying we're tired of dying. Yeah. My sister has lived on the front lines of school shooting culture since it started and she as a teacher when people were saying teachers should walk out teachers should be armed teachers right. this. my sister goes how come we have to fucking do everything this is both like yeah. teachers aren't going to be armed this is a school that what we need is less guns not more right that the fantasy of arming everybody to the teeth. Did you see that thing online where they showed a picture of mo- moments before Ronald Reagan got shot? And there's just all these arrows to all the um, um, yeah you CIA going, good guy with a gun, good guy with a gun, good oh. guy with a gun. And he still got fucking shot. He was surrounded on every side. Yeah. So drop the fantasy that that arming everybody is the answer and start looking at the fact that this country has too many fucking guns. What? And, wait, why and, am I saying anything? Let the children listen to them. We're not. And the thing, too, and I've gotten in a loud fight with my mom in a fucking fancy pizza restaurant about this <laughs> is we're not trying to take away fucking this guy, Eric's fucking gun, his his fucking 22. Have it. Fine. Right. Basic fucking regulations, especially on automatic fucking rifles yes. and automatic weapons and fucking, you know, army grade fucking uh, assault, assault rifles. Weapons, yes. and we- it's just basic fucking regulations in the same way driver's license do in the same way you and I would have to fucking have if we wanted to get an abortion right? or we wanted to get birth control. Yeah. Like we, you know, like what the fuck is the it's, difference? Yeah. And it's The fine. difference is it's a big, big money. And Lots of money. You've been fucking brainwashed. Yes. And if you're not on the side of fucking, t- of protecting children, then you're on the wrong side and you need to fucking know that. Yes. And that idea, the threat of they're coming for our guns is like an NRA based fantasy of this government takeover. Like your boys in office, yeah. I, I, like that you can let go of. They were saying if we just got rid of a hundred thousand guns, there would still be 300,000 in the mix. Yeah. Like this is a, it's, uh, it's a crisis. It's a fucking crisis. It's I'm a real so, crisis. I've been worrying about it and worrying about it. And to see fucking teenagers actually doing something about it is, is, uh, it's, it's overwhelming to me to see it happening and someone doing something about it. And I, and all, all we can do is say that we support it 100%. And please keep, please keep going and please know that you, the fight that, and they know I, none of this needs to be said to them. Right. That's but the we're best talking part. also to, you know, not teenagers yes. who support it as well. And exactly. What we can do is, is tell, just like, is get behind it. As we said, as James Patterson said, murder is forever. You fucking lose your 14 year old in a school shooting. The fucking end. Look around your house. Look around your family and say, who am I willing to lose so that somebody else can have a gun? Because I bet you that answer is fucking nobody. Right. But but it's totally fine for these other families to lose babies, to lose children in the hallway of their high school. That is bullshit. We need to start golden ruling some shit in this country. We need to take back this like, I got mine too bad for your family. Like, And guess what? These kids are the ones that are going to do it. And it's fucking illegal. I'm in, I'm in awe. I'm in fucking awe of these kids. God bless. God bless them. 
Stay sexy. And don't get murdered. Goodbye. Goodbye. Elvis, you want a cookie? Good boy. Good boy. <sighs>